Good evening, everybody. It is Tuesday evening, February the 15th at 7.02 p.m. I am in Council Chambers along with Municipal Coordinator Duarte, CAO Peter DeJohn, and CFO Pamela Rook. All of Council is online virtually, and I see we have a gallery tonight. Uh, council has just come out of a Council Strategy meeting. That's an open meeting and a closed meeting. Both of those meetings remain still open and council will go back to them um, at the end of this meeting. I'm putting forward a call to order and adoption of the agenda. Uh, I have one change to the agenda and that is under mayor's report and let's call it weekend parking. Councillors, do you have any additions, deletions, CAO, CFO? Okay, can I have them? I'll, I'll put forward the motion as uh, put forward with the amendment. Can I have a second, please? Thank you. Any last call, additions, solutions? Otherwise, I'll call a motion, which I'm doing now. I'm calling the motion. All those in favor of the agenda as amended, please confirm by saying yes. Those opposed, no. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Carried. Uh, next item, item number three, which is public participation on uh, two uh, public participation, which is two minutes on a topic of the public's choosing. And I see that there's a variety of people that are on in the gallery. If uh, one of you would unmute, uh, if you both okay, I can see that uh, Clara George is going live screen. So if you would unmute, we'll give you two minutes. Great, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Clara George. I'm a member of the Lions Bay Climate Action Committee. Um, I would like to thank uh, council and staff for, uh, for everything that they have done in the past year to demonstrate climate action leadership. I'm here to address concerns stated in the council reports on the adoption of renewable diesel. I understand there are un ongoing concerns regarding warranties. I reached out to Evan Dacey, Acting Branch Manager, Fleet Strategy and Asset Management at the City of Vancouver, which has been using exclusively 100% R100 in all of their diesel engines for the last couple of years. You've received a copy of his email response. I would like to point out that he wrote that R100 should meet all of the testing requirements of the Canadian standard for diesel fuel, and that the city of Vancouver has not accepted any loss of warranties and stand behind their use of R100 purchased through Suncor. I've provided uh, reports and contact information for the Suncor representatives who specialize in delivering to municipalities. The R100 is delivered from Coast Mountain Fuels. No additional tank is required as it's a drop in fuel. The film industry has been using R100 in generators for a few years now with no loss of power to generators. Of course, I would want this confirmed by you by testing R100 in your own specific generators. And as an update, just recently, all, 77, all 76 stations in the state of California just announced that they are now exclusively filling their diesel pumps with renewable diesel. I confirmed with Suncor that they are in the process of adding between 5 and 30% of R100 in the lower mainland and Kamloops in order to uh, comply with BC government fuel standards and, will, and are planning on steadily increasing this until they hit 100%. Um, which will take longer than what we have. Um, I am thrilled to live in a community that has pledged to join the race to zero. And based on the information submitted by the village in the 2020 CARIP report, diesel fuel contributed 47% to our total village operations emissions. Switching to R100 would immediately reduce those emissions by close to 90% with no impact to existing equipment and at a minimal cost. So I urge you to reconsider your previous decisions, look further into following established footprints and making renewable fuels a part of our village's carbon action plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clara. Um, uh, Public Works Manager, I see your hand up if you could unmute. Yeah, I, um, uh, just a quick, quick uh, uh, statement. So. R100 is not biodiesel, it's not ethanol, it's a pure organic fuel that is a market ready replacement for petroleum diesel. It's 100% um, organically made. It's 
it does meet the federally regulated standard for petroleum diesel. So again, it's a market ready replacement. However, it's not gained acceptance by equipment manufacturers. Ford and Caterpillar um, both will not accept R100 in their equipment and will not warranty engines or powertrains. Um, and that's directly from Ford and directly from Caterpillar. The only people that have uh, accepted R100 fuels are Volvo trucks of North America and Cummins diesel, but only in their newer engines, not their older engines. So the B6, the L9 and higher. Uh, we haven't been able to get any sort of word on our emergency generators. Uh, nobody's responding to our, our emails. Um, the December 14th resolution uh, and that was put forward by staff essentially works on a seven year replacement cycle for the equipment. So basically what we've done is we've said that in the first seven years, when this round of trucks is ready for replacement, we will look to electric vehicles at that point uh, because R100 is not 100% carbon neutral. If electric vehicles have not come up to standard and, and are not able to function as snow plows and construction trucks, at that point, we'll replace with uh, vehicles that are R100 or any other newer technology uh, compatible. Um, the second round is in 2035, and by that time, we expect electric vehicles to have reached uh, a, a status where they are suitable for, for uh, municipal vehicles. Um, Evan Dacey, I'm not sure. Uh, um, I'm not sure what, what he was saying, but in the statement he provided to Clara, he says, warranty claims filed with an equipment supplier uh, need to go through a failure analysis. If they determine the issue is with the fuel, then the warranty claim would not be allowed. And that's basically what Ford and Caterpillar have told us. If they do an analysis, and if that analysis shows that the issue is due to the fuel, they will not warranty the engine or the powertrain. So until we get our equipment manufacturers to accept R100 in their units, uh, we're basically throwing away our warranties. So I, I'm not sure what Evan Dacey at Vancouver is talking about when I spoke to him directly about this and explained it. At that point, he said, yes, our warranties aren't, won't be covered if it's a fuel related issue. So they're absorbing the liability for fuel related issues on their equipment. Thank you very much, Public Works Manager. Um, uh, Councillors, any other comment? Otherwise, we'll go to the next speaker. Sorry, I'll, I'll take one. Um, I'll try it night. Um, so how many of our vehicles and how many pieces of equipment um, are the age that they have some sort of risk on this warranty? So all of our new trucks, they're 2019, uh, and our backhoe, which is a 2018 backhoe, um, th they're all under warranty. Uh, the trucks have a, a five-year powertrain or a six-year powertrain warranty. Uh, it's in one of my council reports, but uh, and, and some of them have been extended as well. Uh, the backhoe warranties have been extended. Sorry, I'm not sure. Maybe I misunderstood you. I thought I thought you said the more modern vehicles don't have an issue. It's the older engines that do. No, only Cummins has accepted it in their modern engines, not their older uh, ones. Only Cummins, our trucks so. are Ford, and the Caterpillar is our backhoe. We, okay. And and they have categorically said no. We will not accept our 100 fuels. Okay, my apologies. I missed the Cummins part. Good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I think on this particular topic, we'll close that off. Uh, uh, Ruth Simons has got her hand up. This isn't a Q&A period with the public. So uh, uh, Mrs. Simons, if you want to uh, make a presentation or ask a question as a public participant, I'd be fine with that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, no, it's just a follow-up question. That's okay. Sure. Which you are welcome it's, to ask. I mean, it's just the follow-up question was, in the two years that City of Vancouver has been using the fuel, have they had any issues with the use of the fuel? Uh, no, they have a specific department uh, with engineering techs that um, screen through their fuel deliveries uh, that, that look at uh, and ensure that their fuel deliveries meet certain standards. So he did say that that's key uh, to ensuring that the fuel meets the federal standards. Um, so like I say, it, like I said in my report, they have an engineering and training reviewing all of the delivery slips that come in for those vehicles, for those uh, loads from Suncor. And they have not had any issues in the, in the last two years. Thank you very much, Councillor Barmere. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Simons, Mrs. Simons. Councillor Barmere, do you have a question? Yeah, I have a comment and a question. I just want to thank Clara for coming to Council and, and putting this issue on the record and clarifying uh, very clearly what R100 can do for us and for our greenhouse gas reduction. So thank you very much, Clara, for, for bringing that forward. Um, I do have a question for, uh, uh, for Public Works Manager Jaffer in the sense that um, I, I guess I wonder how much diesel we're burning in, in, the, in municipal hall heating and if that's a candidate for R100 or if there's any other you know one-offs where we could use diesel uh, R100 diesel that won't um, uh, be met with this sort of warranty uh, barrier? So uh, the hall uses fuel oil it does not use diesel. It's the same thing but okay. Yeah, uh, we would have to check with the furnace manufacturers to see if that's okay. Yeah. And as I said in the council report, the December council report, as we come up to new equipment, as we come up to replacing new equipment, so currently the two oldest pieces of equipment that we have that are not uh, uh, emissions safe, that are extreme polluters, are the Bobcat and the mini excavator. We will be replacing those if council approves with either a tier four, tier five, or with, a, with equipment that can run an R100 pipe fuel. So nice. as we start replacing and cycling through our older equipment, chainsaws, weed eaters, lawnmowers, et cetera, we're going for electric and we're going for uh, equipment that will meet the latest uh, emission standard or run on a pure uh, biofuel like R100. So we're committed to, to reducing our GHGs, as I stated in that council report. Thank you very much. Are you yes. finished, you. Councillor Bermere? Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I go to Councillor Kenliff, so uh, back to the public works manager, I just to reinforce what you said. The capital expenditure program that council uh, saw earlier in the uh, council strategy uh, committee meeting uh, for a significant dollars for two replacements. So those are the ones you're talking about? That's correct. But uh, in the operations budget, there's also replacement of a lawnmower, uh, which is a gas powered lawnmower with an electric powered mower. Um, there's also a replacement of a weed eater with an electric uh, weed eater. And last year we also replaced uh, an, a gas powered weed eater with an electric and a backpack blower, which was gas powered with an electric backpack blower. So we're slowly starting to switch over as these become available and as they are shown to be the same power and service level that we expect with gas. Good. And so just to put a pin on it, so the two significant CapEx items that uh, council reviewed earlier would be conforming in state of the art. Absolutely. Yeah, tier Thank four, you. tier five, or able to run an R100 type fuel. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Conniff? I'd like to, yeah, thank Clara for uh, coming out tonight and making her comments. And I, it's actually kind of a question for Clara that I wonder if the 76 stations in the state of California have all committed to using this type of fuel, how are they mitigating warranty issues with Ford if, there's a lot of pickup trucks in Northern California, I can attest to that. So is there a caveat when you go to fill up? Do you waive your right? So no, I, I believe, sorry, am I allowed to answer? Yeah, please, please. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking at the email again from um, Evan Dacey and, and, you know, 
basically the warranty will become null if the fuel is subpar. So that is the same as if it's petroleum that's subpar. You know, if there's water in a petroleum tank, then your warranty is nullified. So, you know, just like 76 is, is advertising that they're giving you fuel that meets California fuel standards, Suncor is saying they're meeting fuel um, that's, you know, Canadian fuel standards. And as you mentioned, they have had no, the city of Vancouver has had no problem with this fuel. So my other question was, is which I know that Ruth asked one, but, or, but at, when, you know, with, when they're looking over those reports, have they ever found a delivery from Coast Mantle fuel to be subpar? Because Suncor is also inspecting that fuel, the distributor is inspecting that fuel, and then the city is inspecting that fuel. So obviously we're not gonna, we don't have an engineering team to inspect the fuel, but the warranty is nullified if there's water or dirt in any fuel, in your per, car, in any car. Per, correct. However, both Caterpillar and Ford have categorically said that they won't accept the warranty issue on the engine or powertrain if we're using an R100 fuel. So I'm not sure how Evan gets around that. Uh, he doesn't get around that. He explained to me that they don't have a warranty on Ford equipment. In fact, I'll share an email that I received with him from him with you and the rest of the Climate Action Group. Thank you very much, Public Work Manager. Uh, uh, unless there's another member of the gallery, there's still a couple of you who wish to come forward. I think we can go another two minutes, otherwise we'll move on for this evening. There being no one, thank you very much to the gallery for participating with us tonight and hopefully staying. Uh, which brings us to item number four, which is uh, the minutes of the prior meetings. And I'll put forward the motion that uh, the regular council meetings minutes of February the 1st, 2022 be approved as circulated. Can I have a second, please? Thank you. And uh, any discussion, any, uh, well, not discussion, any changes, any amendments, any additions? Councillors? I have none. I have one. Uh, Councillor Abbott, which one? Uh, page eight. Um, there's a few statements after the, the bold statement to which this concert, Councillor Barmer, left the meeting. There's then three statements, um, kind of paraphrasing, was trying to summarize what um, Mayor McLaughlin, Councillor Bain, and Councillor Cunliffe had to say. Um, there's nothing quoting me. I acutely aware as others were, I'm the only person that was opposed to that. And I think I stated fairly clearly why I was opposed to it. Um, and I would like that to be part of the record. Can I just state oh. that again? Uh, Councillor Abbott, can I, could you cite the page again? Eight. Eight of 13. Eight of 200. Eight of 200. It's page mm -hmm. four of 13. Page thank you. Thank you, I've got the right page now. Um, so back to this, Councilor Abbott, uh, what would you ask be shown just on the move in second part? Um, uh, and I did go, I didn't um, write it down verbatim, but I did go check that I said uh, words to this effect. Um, I made the statement that I believed 52 Brunswick, as well as their neighbors, had bought beach access property and had reasonable rights to access the beach. And I explained that the reason I was opposed to this motion was purely because I felt that um, they should have first approached Front Desk BC and that I think that should be the case for all applications. And I didn't believe that uh, approving this was going to make that go away. Thank you. I agree. I clearly remember that. Uh, Municipal Coordinator, can you make an amendment in there? Yeah, sorry. I put it under the discussion part, but I can just take those last two points of this under discussion and put your name beside that. It says it under discussion. It's, it's if you look at where it starts discussion in Sudan on that page, and you go to the bottom two bullets. Okay. 
which are concerned with not following regulations and asking for forgiveness later. And the second one would have liked to see front counter BC decision first and the municipal coordinator suggesting segregating that and attributing that to you. And plus uh, the other comments you've just made, if that's fine with you. Okay, we will be fine. Uh, so noted, thank you, municipal coordinator. Okay, uh, anything else, councillor? Any <coughs> changes, amendments, deletions? Nobody raising their hands, I'll call a motion. All those in favor of the minutes as amended, please confirm by saying yes, those opposed no. Yes. Yeah, thanks, carried, good. Next uh, piece is business arising from the minutes. Uh, I have none, but I have, well, actually I have one which I'm carrying into unfinished business and that's Mr. Weary. Uh, anybody else with something else that they want to bring up? Yeah, I have a matter arising. Uh, page 12. Um, halfway down the page, this is the discussion of BC Utilities Commission hearings. So uh, just for an update for everyone, I attended a meeting this week from BC Hydro um, on the pricing principles application. I was a, wasn't quite sure when the meeting started what this is about, but just for everyone's information, because they're going for a new rate um, adjustment to utilities and they're not ready to do that, they've come up with an interim rate adjustment. So this is just the interim. But what I thought what was interesting was they asked me for a 0.62% increase for the year. Um, they've decided that the step two pricing, which those of us who heat our homes with electric will be acutely aware of, will remain unchanged. And the entire increase would go on the step one pricing. So they acknowledge in the meeting effectively, and they pretty much admitted it, they believe the disparity between step one and step two um, is unfair and is punitive, but they're not ready to take it away. And that will be part of this um, um, approach that would be intended to do um, if I become an intervener. Um, but it was just interesting to me that they seem to be accepting that. And then if uh, for everyone's benefit, there's also been an, a 2% adjustment to the deferral account rate rider. So in actual fact, everyone should see the, the bill go down for the year. Um, but we'll see how that works out. It always works out in math, but not always in practice. So yeah, I just thought I'd give everyone that update. Um, and if anyone's got any questions. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Council Rabbit, for this valuable and interesting information. And we look forward to hearing more from you. And uh, back to the intervener status, which you well, I, I, we've said yes. Does that mean you're in? Okay, then. Um, no, yeah, I can't, you can't do it until they announce it. So they're doing this interim plan, delaying the other announcement of the rate adjustments for April. So we'll keep our ears um, wide open, eyes glued to the press and make sure we don't miss it. If someone sees it and thinks I missed it, let me know. Good, old, thank you very much. Um, um, I have one other matter arising, different matter. On the same page, um, there's a bunch of bullets on the base mart stuff, the third bullet from the bottom, working with staff, we green bin liners. So um, yes, staff got us, uh, got a bunch of samples of larger sized bins. Um, sorry, larger sized bin liners that are acceptable um, to waste, waste control. Um, and I've tried to get a few people interested in trying them out. Staff have some more in the office. I encourage council or anyone else that's listening, please check with your neighbors. They use those old brown bags or even worse, if they don't use any bags in their bin liner and it becomes smelly. We, we have these, we'd like people to try them out um, and make sure they work and see if we can promote that. So get a hold of me or tell them to go down to the office and grab some free bin liners and see if they can make it work. And once again, the whole idea here is to keep your bin cleaner and you can seal a liner, which is a, effectively a biodegradable, sorry, compostable pa plastic. Um, then you can seal the smells in and those paper ones don't do that. Thank you very much. Uh, 
other counselors, anything to, to bring up on uh, business rising? Otherwise, we'll move on. None, thank you. Uh, unfinished business. We'll quickly go through this uh, rail crossing. Uh, Mr. Jaffer, I'm sure nothing to report other than I see the engineering study in our budget. That's pretty much the latest breaking, thank you. Uh, the SPCA rodent aside prohibition, they're still following up with the SPCA. Yeah, it's it's on our work list, but it's um, it's a little low on the list. So we'll eventually get there. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, for the CFO, I, we're still on schedule for the payroll data. Thank you. And uh, for council, I spoke with Mr. Marsh this past week. He's happy to wait and looking forward to the information like the rest of us. And which brings us to the final piece which was, uh, and maybe I've got the pages wrong, but I've got it in the middle of page 10 of 13 of mine. Uh, it's, it's mine. Yes, uh, 10 of 13 of mine. And that is um, uh, about uh, Lions Bay uh, BAC member, Mr. Weary, and his request for information on Fire Smart Watershed and Geohazard. And I recall that Councilor Kind of fast that this be brought forward. We didn't deal with it at the time. I said we'd carry it here. And so here it is. And staff, could you advise if we. Yeah, I responded to Mr. Weary. There we go. So that this would be done. Yes. Thanks for doing that, Peter. Appreciate Good. it. Good. Thank you very much. So we'll strike that, Carla. Uh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Abbott. Um, yeah, just one comment on. Uh, on a nice um, comment about the BCSPCA. Um, I'm aware that the Bird Friendly Group have received a, um, a fair amount of literature from the BCSPCA on this topic and other matters and from other people. Um, so uh, we know it's low on your priority, but uh, someone might give you a little prod and push you in a, in a direction with uh, some information. Absolutely, welcomed. Thank you very much. Uh, generous offer. Good, thank you. Uh, which brings us to uh, the next piece, which uh, public works manager get warmed up, and it is about the treatment plant. And, and the motion is that the KG wastewater treatment plant annual report for 2021 be received. I'll put that forward. Can I have a second, please? Good, we'll not move to discussion. Works manager, if you want to recap your very detailed report, please do, and then we'll go to discussion and questions. Yeah, I'll just highlight the anomalies. Uh, so we had six uh, instances where we exceeded our permit allowance uh, for wastewater discharge into Kelvin Grove Bay. Um, and that's 340 meters cubed. Uh, the six exceedances are listed in the report uh, from 375 up to 525. And essentially what the, the report does is it shows the rainfall uh, that we received uh, versus the discharge of the sewage. And you can clearly see that the rainfall and the sewage discharge are linked. Heavy rains uh, equal increased outflow um, in a closed sewer system, that shouldn't happen. So clearly we have inflow and infiltration uh, and the smoke testing that we have planned for this year will identify that and um, we'll have areas that we need to fix to help eliminate those uh, INIs. Right, councillors, any questions? I have a couple. Oh, no, I, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just thinking. No, you go, then, Norm, you go first. Start to so I would like, does that not point at a potentially bigger problem? I mean, what is that saying? How does that happen that we get infiltration into sewer lines that are clearly buried? Um, so I and I is, yeah, I and I is a, a problem that every municipality is facing. As your pipes age, the joints start to leak and water gets in. Uh, water gets in through manholes. Uh, when water is flowing down the street instead of a ditch, it flows into the manholes. Um, and then the other problem is uh, uh, illegal connections. So 
as somebody's building the house, if they connect their roof leaders to the sanitary system, as opposed to draining it to the ditch, that will inflate our, our discharges. So smoke testing basically involves filling the line full of smoke and the smoke escapes through any cracks or openings. Uh, and we're able to pinpoint those and identify what the root cause is at that point. So we'll be able to identify if smoke uh, comes out of a roof leader, for example, on the side of a house, we'll know that that house is connected to the sanitary rather than into the ditch. Okay, thanks, Matt. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Robert. Um, I'll just, um, I'll touch on what um, you were just talking about first thing. So now, yeah, I had a similar thought about um, legal connections or let's call them erroneous connections, incorrect connections. So, but on Kelvin Grove, on the upper road, there, there is a stormwater pipe there, right? Because there's areas where there's an open grid, looks like a catch basin in the road. So that's, so is it possible that stormwater pipe is somehow interacting with the sewer water? Uh, no, typically the stormwater uh, pipe was installed at the time of subdivision. And at that point, there were engineers reviewing it, so they would not have connected the stormwater to no, the sanitary. I'm, I'm wondering if the stormwater might be blocked or failed, or somehow water buildup might be causing part of the issue. Absolutely, and that that's something that the smoke testing will identify. Okay, so the smoke testing. Um, so we've got our budget item. Um, we spoke about it earlier. So is staff going to actually do the, do the testing? Are we buying equipment so we can do this ourselves? Or are we no. employing a contractor? We're employing a contractor. It's very, um, very specialized. Um, they use drones. They use other methods to locate the smoke. Uh, the machinery for the smoke testing is relatively inexpensive. It's about three to $5,000. Um, but if it's done once every five years and the issues are addressed, uh, it's it's probably something that we don't really need our staff to to get trained in. Okay, I was just wondering if it's going to be if it's joints that are starting to fail, they're going to they're going to keep failing. Um, anyway, I just yeah, I don't believe it's joints, Councillor Abbott. I think um, it's more other issues, either a, a, a problem with a storm connection uh, or a storm sewer connected to. The sanitary um, unless we've got a big break in our system somewhere and again smoke testing will find that okay um page 20 of your report um the fog issue um and you <laughs> made a statement that the fog brochure was developed and mailed out and then by august fog concentrations have dropped to below 50 from a previous 534 milligrams, milligrams per liter. Um, yeah, if, uh, that's a, a little misleading. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, you, it you, was, your, your talent is wasted. If you yeah, it's not, make that it's, change. Not, it's not the fog brochure uh, alone that reduced the fog concentrations. At the same time that we issued the brochure, we also introduce the bioengineered bacteria, which is capable of reducing fog concentrations. So, okay. yeah. Um, is, that, is that now stable? Do you think that issue is behind us? Correct, yes. Yeah, we'll continue to use the bioengineered bacteria uh, to keep on top of it. Um, but as a general reminder to residents, it, it's important to, to not uh, be draining or, or pouring uh, cooking oils or other other forms of fog into the drains. Okay. Yeah, just an observation, right, that graph shows it almost perfectly parallels the, the rainwater, so I think you definitely got that, that one nailed. Um, on, the, uh, on the map that's attached um, of all the houses that are connected through the sewer, um, there is one resident who's on the call tonight. He's on the other side of the creek that's connected to the sewer. Yeah, Councillor Abbott um, 
CAO uh, Dijon pointed that out. This is a map of the sanitary sewer system. It's not a map of the residences connected to that. Uh, and 270 Ocean View is connected to the sanitary system. Uh, so, you know, like, like the rest of the homes on Kelvin Grove, I don't show their private connections. This is just the sanitary mains. It was, it was more a statement about if we if we're trying to find out if we have an issue in, in pipes or leaks or somehow um, that, that that line way. will be smoke tested as well. One more comment. One second. Yeah. Um, do we? Is there any issue with? Um, even though we now we're pretty convinced it's just uh, rainwater, stormwater, some site, mm -hmm. some type getting in there. But is there any? Are we getting any um, grief from you know, from authorities about these out of compliances? Is there, um, is there a not as there? of yet. No, no. The report was submitted on January thirty first, um, and it takes them a while to go through it. Uh, so you expect there might be some sort of order and date by which we have to correct it or anything? Uh, no, because we have a plan in place to correct it. I don't think it, you know, knock on wood, I don't think it'll um, uh, generate an issue. Most most municipal sewer plants have that same issue of I&I. &I. Uh, it's an ongoing issue that's been going on for years. So, but we'll see. All right, Thank thanks and thanks for that. It's a, it's a great report. It's very thorough. Not sure the subject matter is everyone's favorite, but uh, it's a good report. Thank you. Thank you. Glad it's operations, one of my favorite projects. There we go, Councillor Bain. Um, yeah, <clears throat> just a bit of an oddball question, if you don't mind, is um, on page 20 of 200 on the uh, second line down, I wrote this bioengineered bacteria. Uh, in this age of gain of function viruses, are we uh, taking any risk with a bioengineered bacteria or is it stable and safe? If somebody goes by the treatment plant, are they at any risk? No, it's been, um, it's been on the, uh, uh, it, it's been a solution for decades. Uh, it's well tested and, and well researched. It, and it's not really, it's not a genetically engineered bacteria. It's a natural bacteria that that consumes fog. Um, it's just uh, by bioengineered. It's just you know packaged in a concentrated puck that hangs in the flow channel, and as the wastewater goes across it, the bacteria get released. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are no more questions for the works manager, I will call the motion. I guess I just have one one question. We, repairs to this, we have absolutely no idea what the cost will be until the smoke testing is done. That's correct, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Councilor Kellogg. Call the motion. All those in favor of uh, receiving the report, please confirm by saying yes. Those opposed, no. Yes. yes. Thank you, Nye. Thank you, Hardy. Yes, Works Manager. Next up is. Um, the Emergency Preparedness Fund ESS resolution, which I will read. And that is uh, that the municipality submitted an application for grant funding under the UBCM Community Emergency Preparedness Fund Emergency Support Services Stream for the updating of ESS supplies and equipment and volunteer training project and that council supports the current proposed activities of the project and direct staff to provide overall grant management. I'll put that forward. Councillor Abbott, can you put that as a second? Yes, thank you. Sorry, I'll second that, yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll hand this over to the uh, CFO, but the report is very detailed and I ask that she be brief. Yeah, basically um, this is a resolution that's required for a grant that has already been submitted. We were given an extension for the grant because we found out about it after the due date and Phil Fulkerson was able to get the grant done in an incredibly short period of time. So this is just to close the, um, close the package. I'll send a certified resolution in tomorrow and then the grant will be officially submitted. Good. Well, let's say a hearty thank you to staff for the close relationship with UBCM to 
get this extended. Uh, councilors, any questions? Uh, Councilor Barmer, are you first? No, I'm just uh, expressing my thanks to Pam. Here you go. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Van. There, got it. Um, yeah, I, I, maybe I'm a bit of a nerd on the emergency stuff, but uh, I, I'm really quite excited to see the progress and uh, with our uh, with Phil coming on board with us and getting this much done so quickly, um, I'm doubly impressed. Um, good on him. And uh, but one question I have in the financial summary um, on the middle way down is a, a line there that says volunteer initiative for thirty six hundred dollars. Um, I, I don't read. Really, what is this? <laughs> Whoops. Sorry about the phone. <laughs> Councilor Green, can you unmute and let's go through the question again? I think we were dying to see who picked up. Oh. Yeah, I heard the question. I'm just not sure how to answer it, actually. Um, okay, we, so we got the question. The the fact. Do you know what the volunteer initiative is? I think it's basically the summary, it's just categorizing the, the items oh, right. one, two, Sorry. three, four, five, <laughs> the top half as volunteer initiative, and then the, the other items are sort of ESS equipment and supplies. Yeah, sorry about that. The CFO didn't realize it was a subtotal. It's a subtotal. <laughs> well, that'll teach you to prepare the report. It. I, I didn't do this. <laughs> I just literally did the resolution. Well, so the math after either. Author. And just, just to clarify, it was uh, Mr. Falkerson's efforts that uh, yes. with UBCM that got the, the late uh, uh, submission approved. Yes. Good. Councillors, any other question? Uh, questions? Yeah. I, uh, just for clarity, this is a 100% grant? Uh, correct. Yes. Okay. I, I was aware of that, but I just make sure everyone understands it doesn't say that in the report. Um, yeah, and uh, I once I'd also like to thank Phil for his efforts in turning this around so fast. Uh, good job. I've got some questions about exactly the use of some of these, but I'll keep that for the EPC meeting. There you go. Uh, if there are no further questions, I'll call the motion which I will now, I am calling a motion. All those in favor, please confirm by saying yes. Those opposed, no. Yes. 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 Thank you very much uh, to uh, staff and film. Next item is the municipal grants. There's a variety of them. Uh, there are not many compared to prior years and the information is pretty succinct. So I would ask that we go through this quickly. Uh, the motion is that council approve the 2022 municipal grants presented in the report to council today. I'll put that forward. Can I have a second? Thank you. CFO? Uh, yes, so we bring this every year. It's the municipal grant applications as indicated by the mayor. Um, there's not as many cash requests this year. One of the reasons we bring it forward for approval rather than waiting until the budget is adopted is mainly because of the in-kind. Um, if some of these events are occurring prior to when the budget is adopted, then it will have received the in-kind approval. Uh, the only other piece with this that's still outstanding is two of the grants, the Quilting Group and the Bird Friendly, have requested, made an insurance request. So we will have to discuss um, the best way to handle that insurance request. Uh, the Events Committee, the Trailblazers and the Seniors has something called a Service Provider Agreement but that's for services provided for on behalf of the municipality. So it's services that municipalities often undertake themselves, but um, small municipalities in particular will have um, committees that take it over for them. So that, I, I'm not sure that would be an accepted form for the quilting group. Um, even the bird friendly might be a bit of a stretch, but I think the, the CAO can speak further to that back to his original insurance report. Um, the other, what the other groups do, the Historical Society and the others, they just purchase the insurance through our portal. We compensate them for the cost of that, but they do get their own insurance. All the other groups do, other than these three that I mentioned. Um, okay, so, um, like I said, the applications are fairly straightforward. I wasn't sure if there were any questions about the applications. I don't think you have to oversell it. Councillor, uh, any question? It's 5,300 bucks, more or less for a potpourri of uh, good causes and village interests. Uh, 
The only uh, question I had was for the Lions Bay Arts Council. I mean, is that a is that is there any advertising for that on the website? If someone, if new residents or someone wants to get involved with the Lions Bay Arts Council, how do they make that connection? Like, what? How do they? How do they find that? Every new resident that I introduce, I've referred them uh, to a variety of things. But I, actually, I think the group is so large they just stumble upon it. Okay. Okay. So there's no link on the website. To the, to the, to the uh, I don't know about that. Um, we do have, um, on the website, we do list all the volunteer groups, and I believe there's links with all of them. Okay. I did a quick search, and I couldn't find it. I was just curious if there's a way for new community members to find those things, make those connections, if they're not entrenched in the community already. Mm -hmm. yep. Other counselors, please speak up. Can I just... Um pass a comment on their, on their insurance. Um, I think the um, not getting insurance for the bird friendly initiative um, would be difficult for that group. I, and I would argue it'd be very unfair. Um, it's not just they have this event planned in the hall, which has you know, very many people involved, including trailblazers and others that have their own insurance already. Um, there's a walk that's going to be part of it. I don't really want to go into too much and let the cat out of the bag here. Um, and there was a, a planned, which will probably happen later, a planned shoreline cleanup. I, I, I don't think any one particular resident putting their name forward and buying the insurance should uh, be taken on that, that liability. I guess Pam, you said uh, for another discussion, um, but I would encourage staff to definitely on the bird friendly thing, um, find a way to get this done, um, this insurance, because I don't think it's reasonable for, for one person to take on. So uh, with, I think what we're talking about here with respect to the municipal grant applications is the in kind for with respect to the hall rentals. So with respect to those two, um, um, groups, the craft group and the bird friendly initiative in respect to the hall rentals, my suggestion would be that we simply say that the insurance requirement is zero. So they still have to sign the, the uh, application form to rent the hall because that provides waiver of liability and, and release. Uh, the indemnification is limited to the amount of the insurance. So if the amount of the insurance required is zero, then the indemnification requirement is zero. So we had talked about doing things that way uh, when we last discussed uh, the insurance and we made the amendments to the uh, waiver uh, release and indemnity form. And so that's part of the, the amended rental package now. So if we do that, then, you know, that basically deals with the, the insurance requirement with respect to that, those two groups and the in-kind for the hall rental, which is what we're talking about right now in terms of the municipal grant application. In terms of bird friendly groups, activities within the community, um, I, I don't see that they need to have insurance for those activities, just like there's no insurance carried to the best of my knowledge for um, the folks who do the native plant garden stuff or um, the community garden, there's all kinds of things that happen in and around the community by people doing gardening on sides of berms and things like that in neighborhoods to beautify areas. They don't need to have insurance. I, I don't see that there's a real need for um, these folks to, to have insurance for what it is they want to do. Maybe, I'm, maybe I just need to drill deeper or have a conversation level with, with you perhaps in terms of all of those activities and, and whether or not there's risks that they ought to be thinking about or that we should discuss. But just on the face of it, I don't see that that's really necessary. It's a pretty generous offer, Councillor Abbott. Are you willing to take it offline? We will take it offline, thanks. Thank you. Councillors, any other questions on these uh, grants to these deserving community residents that are doing good things for a variety of reasons? None? Just call. Give, me one, give me one second. I had some flag yet. One second.
to you know, page 82 eventually got there. Um, yeah, just just a little thing, I guess. Just me picking up on numbers. Um, page 82, um, calculate the, uh, the in-kind payment for the hall rental by the hour. And I think that's because they have one hour sessions. Um, but then they have another six hour session and they charge that and they calculate that at by the looks of it, six times 25. You don't, it doesn't cost $25 per hour to rent the hall, right? No, oh, sorry, I, I printed out the, um, the unnumbered one. So is, whose application was that? The arts, was that the arts? Outside? Uh, yes, art, this is the art spot program, yeah. Yeah, so what we did is we didn't take that number because <laughs> as a volunteer group, there's a flat rate of $25 for the, for the, for the month. So as you can see, um, when we did the in-kind for that, it was a lower amount. No, you and, didn't. Okay. Yeah, um, some of them do try to att attempt to do it. Because um, if you're doing it individually, then, then there's a different rate. And the in-kind, I mean, we don't book that 2305. It was just sort of to give an indication to council of the fees that they're waiving. But the important part is that you approve the in-kind so that we don't have to keep going back for resolutions every time someone wants to rent the hall. It's just sort of a, an estimate because some of the groups don't even know exactly how many times they'll rent the hall throughout the year. But it's just um, it's just to get that resolution that yes, the municipal grant has been approved and the um, the fees have been waived for them. Okay, All right. So you picked it up. You didn't use that number. Yep. That's fine. Um, page ninety one, native plant garden signage. Um, Maybe uh, Mike can answer this. Is this the same signage that you would procure on, on behalf of these guys? And I mean, is it, should it not be an, an in kind number? They, they're, not, they're not buying the signage, right? Uh, it is signage that we are procuring at our rate, uh, and they are buying it. They've, they've included it in their budget. Um, uh, uh, but, yeah. But, but you would buy the signage. That's correct. So we could get our rates for it. Yes. Wondering if it should be listed. The rest of the stuff on this list, I'm assuming they go out and procure themselves. So are you suggesting to strike it from the list and, and include it I in think operation? It covered, I think you got it covered elsewhere. That's just an accounting how you balance it up. I was just making sure this is the signage that the village is going to buy. Yeah. Um, the native plant garden is designing it and we will buy it through our account. So we get that discounted rate. So the native plant garden won't need to find $985 because 500 of that is signage that you procure on their behalf. Right. I, I had assumed that they would be paying us for that signage. We're going to give them a grant and then they're going to pay you for grant. Yeah. So I can't quite find their grant. I, I believe they had other sources of funds as well, the Native Plant Garden. Let's just pause for a second. Um, Yes, I mean, if we procure it on their behalf, then... Um, Just be yeah, there's, no, there's no need to pay, pay us back, is there? Okay. No. I, I really didn't give that one much thought, Neville. Okay. It's because you're asking for the net amount of 600, which I don't think includes the... Um, okay. I'll follow so, up with them. So yeah. for, for, for this, let's just modify this. Uh, so in, in the bigger picture, it's... Uh, this will be a, an operational issue to signage. So that amount is reduced from the total, uh, which I think is where Councilor Abbott was going. Uh, so. But I do believe they're asking for 600 net up signage. And that's what I have. Yes. For. So we're just taking the signage. Mm -hmm. Okay. But we won't reduce the grant request is what I'm saying. I think they want 600 plus us signage. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Abbott, are you good? Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Uh, I will call a motion. All those in favor, please confirm by saying yes, opposed no. 
Good. Good. Thank you very much, everybody. And then moving on to reports. And um, um, I, <clears throat> I'm good. I called the thing for the agenda weekend parking, uh, but really it involves a couple of resident emails that came to council uh, this weekend. And it was about a hiker parking in front of a hydrant, which precipitated the weekend parking. So there's two pieces to this. Uh, council has seen the latest round of um, correspondence. Uh, so uh, municipal coordinator, um, I thought it would be on an on-table item. Would you please card it for the documentation as an on-table on item? Uh, so that it'll become part of the, the next package. Council's familiar with the issue, so is um, his staff. So to that, uh, I would gear our, our discussion on two points. One, uh, which was where we left it, with me writing to the RCMP relative to um, writing a ticket uh, for the car. So that's the first one. And the second one, which has been a concern of one of the councillors too, is the overall parking. So why don't we go with this? And so I'll turn it off to the turn it over to the CAO to bring us into the loop on um, on a quick background and a suggested recommendation for the parking piece relative to the hiker who parked next to the hydrant, and then we'll go to a more broader discussion, uh, very pointed on parking in general and I believe ultimately enforcement. Okay. Um... On the, on the first item in terms of, uh, of uh, enforcement against blatant things like parking in front of a hydrant uh, at this time of year. Um, you know, in the past, uh, the RCMP has come to Lions Bay at certain times and has received ticket books from us and some of their officers have written uh, a number of tickets. Um, and so, that, that I thought was one possibility. Uh, I think there's probably some procedural clarifications uh, required in terms of um, what I saw in the way of um, uh, emails with uh, the staff sergeant. So I'll follow up with him on that stuff. But it occurred to me that um, in the circumstances where we have photographic evidence uh, and a clear violation that, um, you know, we are in a position to uh, look up the perpetrator's um, license plate and send them, a, send them a letter in the mail. It's considered served seven days after we send it um, and issue them a ticket. Uh, they're lucky they didn't get towed. Uh, in the future, uh, a further option would be, and I'll have to talk to the fire chief about this, but um, you know, if he's in a position to uh, issue a ticket, he is an authorized person under the uh, bylaw enforcement officer, bylaw number 506, I think it is. Um, and so he could issue a ticket and perhaps delegate uh, a member to wait around for the tow truck. Um, or possibly, yeah. So I, I'll, I can talk to him about what that procedure looks like and, and what that option looks like. Uh, okay, so if we could stop there then. Okay, we'll, we'll split the two if that's fine. Uh, so just to quickly editorialize, doing this in-house, which means it can be done tomorrow if staff has time, and we move this up and um, the CIO begin discussion with uh, the chief uh, to see if he'd buy in to write the ticket. Should an event like this occur again when we don't have BEOs in place? The objective here is that uh, if somebody's going to be as blatant with a, a hydrant like this, my, me personally, I'm towing. And the only way to do that is to have one of the volunteer, the fire and volunteer, fire first and volunteers attend the site until the tow truck arrives. So I, I think my direction going to the RCMP may have been good hearted, but we can do it much faster our way and CEOs come up with another good solution too. And I think this is something we should bring forward uh, during the discussion of the parking plan. So I think we've done the same thing twice. So to the councillors for this first piece of the equation, uh, what's everybody's views on that? Councillor Abbott, if you don't mind uh, going left to right here, we'll start with you. 
Um, yeah, so no comment on, on that. Um, obviously, you've got a fair amount to say about the broader parking plan, but we'll do that later. That's fine. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Bain. Do you agree? Um, yeah, I'm not hard and fast on one way or the other, but uh, I thought there might be an opportunity to have uh, BEOs on weekends um, for this time. I've heard residents uh, complaining that on the on the north side or north end of the village, um, weekends are getting crowded even now as people are sort of jumping out through the trails, not out with every break in the sunshine. So that's uh, my note that I sent out earlier was more along that line, but um, I'll okay. go to council. Uh, so what, we'll just park this. This is part two of the questions that I've asked the CAO to address. So. Uh, are you fine with the remedy of us issuing the ticket and discussion with the chief on futures for fire hydrant related items? Sure. Good. Thank you. Councillor Barmer, your views? Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate uh, them being willing to take that on uh, as an extra task. I mean, that's, um, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Councillor Cunliffe, if you could bring it on. Yeah, I've just got a question. Of when the RCMP does come down and do that, is this then additional fees that we're being charged? Do we not get kind of billed per call that they make here? So we're... No. Really, no? It's no. a flat rate? Okay. Well, I'm happy to yeah. have... Yeah, a flat rate of a quarter million for the village, yeah. <laughs> well, then... I'm happy to have the RCMP come and do this. I, 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 the money. Unfortunately, to fill in your ultimate question, if I was a villager and I phoned uh, the Squamish detachment, which wouldn't be answering, and I'd be going to ecom and you'd be waiting for an hour and a half before you left your message. You get the idea. So I think yeah. the is the better idea. Agreed. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Councillors. The second piece, CAO, uh, which is where uh, some of our emails internally amongst the councillors has been, and Councillor Bain has articulated the issue of uh, busyness of the season. Uh, I, I'm sure the other councillors, when they're driving around, see it too. I mean, it's quite struck with the warm, warm uh, Sunday and a very large number of people walking around. Um, so the issue of the BEOs and the parking plan being addressed earlier, sooner, or even temporary assistance. I'll let you respond to that and the councillors may have some questions. Okay, I think it's, you know, a couple of you have mentioned this aspect of it and it's weather dependent. And uh, so A, we don't have BEOs uh, not available at this point. Um, and uh, B, it would be difficult to schedule them based upon the weather. Um, you know, is it going to be sunny next weekend? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but staff need to have that kind of of, uh, uh, of knowledge and and be able to, um, you know, they're not going to they're not going to go for call call me on Saturday morning because the sun came out. Um, it's just not really very feasible. We've got to get to, and we're not ready. We, we, you know, there's a lot of preparation to do in respect of signage, and we don't have meters that's got to be arranged. Everything sort of set for April 1st was how we left it. Um, we also have uh, some things to revisit in terms of, um, of how, we, how we go about doing enforcement and what that looks like. And uh, those things will come back in the parking plan shortly, but. Um, we're not really in a position to start having people issuing tickets on weekends. Um, yeah, I, I can I can imagine that when it's nice, uh, people are going to come out and um, look for something to do and go for a hike. But uh, you know, at this point in time, um, they they've got uh, they can park for free where the meter parking is at the top of Sunset. They can park in a school parking lot, it's on the weekends. And um, and really the only place they can't park, you know, they can park in any of the areas along Bayview that are uh, signed for, uh, for pay parking from April to November. Um, they just can't park where the, where the permit parking is. And I can, I can certainly see that there would be people who would take advantage of the fact that, um, or the understanding that there may not be anyone around to enforce. So 
uh, to heck with the permit parking signage. Um, but, um, you know, and, and I'm sure that's going to happen from time to time. It's one of those things that as a small municipality is, is uh, difficult to meet all of the challenges of capacity um, at all times of the year. Uh, I fear that if we were to hire back the bylaw officers at this point in time, there wouldn't be enough for them to do most of the time. Um, and so that becomes a, a challenge as well. It's, it's, it's not in our budget at this point. Thank you very much, CEO. Uh, first, Councillor Abbott and then Councillor Cunliffe. Yeah, so I just want to touch on something. Um, Peter, you said you can imagine what in a nice sunny day. Well, I don't have to imagine. I live it. Um, and Councillor Bain probably does to a lesser extent. But all of, all of the people that live on the top parts of Bayview, Stewart, Mountain Drive or Sunset um, live this throughout the year. And I've said more than once in our previous reviews of our parking plan, we should do away with the seasonality. I understand you can't, we can't necessarily afford to have someone here full time, um, but all we need to do is to have someone, um, be it the odd weekend, be it ad hoc, be it whatever it is. And I'm sure there's one of, at least one or two of those vital officers that wouldn't mind a weekend work here and there. We, we don't have to police it every day. We just need to make sure that hikers understand because they talk. I personally witnessed last weekend telling someone that's a parking, parking, parking. His buddy looked at him and said, questioning me like, well, you told me to park here. And the other guy said, I don't worry, he can't do anything. And they walked off. Um, and, it's, and, it, and, it, and, that, and they talk to each other. And it gets worse and worse and worse until you've got someone parking in front of a hydrant. So, so we have to make, somehow make the statement and make it known um, that we expect people to follow the uh, parking regulations. And I think we should just completely do away with all this seasonal idea. Leave, leave the street parking charges in place. Um, you don't have to police it every day. Um, some people, uh, I see people all the time trying to pay for it because they haven't read the sign. Like, how do I give you my money? It's still going on. You get that as well. It creates confusion. Um, and it, and it, it's just not, not helping the situation. Thank you very much, Councillor Abbott. Uh, CAO, when will parking plan be coming forward? Uh, more or less, probably March 15th. Uh, no, first, that has to be the first, the first of March, yeah. Oh, uh, so Councillor Abbott, just uh, so the parking plan will come forward on, on uh, March the first, and I don't see we're going to have concluded the budget that we did preliminary talks with tonight. So, I'd ask that you uh, maybe the CFO work on whatever number you might think, or she might think, if this is a, a partial strength throughout the balance of the year. Uh, it, it's a discussion point, which is budget and parking plans. So I'd like to leave it there. Councillor Cunliffe and then Councillor Barmer. Yeah, I would like to actually echo uh, Councillor Abbott's comments. Our real estate is valuable 12 months of the year, not seasonally. Like what Councillor Abbott just said, people innately will try to pay. Most people will try to do the right thing. Those that will circumvent what they can, will and do. And in that case, if someone's parked in front of a fire hydrant, a simple call from any resident can have them towed. Is, is that not... Could someone clarify that for me? Um, sporadic policing, just to send the message. But if we leave the pay parking in place, most people will comply. So I would like to see that become part of the parking plan. I think it's year round where it's a new era. People are gonna be coming out here every day and month of the year, whenever there's an opportunity, not just April to September. Thank you very much, Councillor Cunliffe. So to recap, this is not just a parking plan, but it's a budget thing. So uh, let's have staff we're going to be presenting both the budget and the parking plan to us at the next council meeting, be cognizant of our request. Uh, Councillor Barmer and then Councillor Abbott. Yeah, I'd just like to, to second what both Councillor Abbott and Councillor Cunliffe have said in terms of uh, year-round metering and, you know, additional revenue. Um, we've seen it 
we've seen it on, on in the budget. We're we're uh, we're, we're uh, cash positive on the revenue metering, which is which is good to see. I, I wonder if we could take it a step further, and you know, I don't know if the trail could the gate to the trail could be pushed down, and we could actually expand that parking lot. Uh, to throw a few more spots up there, um, you know, they can just be gravel. They don't need to be paved. I don't know if that's an option, but um, providing more public parking is is uh, something we should, you know, consider if that's an option at all. Um, but I, I understand where Council Abbott's coming from. Uh, it's not nice to have people blocking your streets and um, just ignoring cur common courtesy. So I, I think that. Uh, by law enforcement should be looked at a bit closer. Thank you very much, Councillor Barmer. Councillor Cunliffe, can you put your hand down? Councillor Abbott, you're up, and Councillor Bain, you're on deck. Um, yeah, one other thing when we bring that um, back um, for consideration. Um, public Works have a, have a counter on the trails. Um, I have seen uh, some of the first data that was from those first few months from those counters wasn't shared with everyone. I think um, it would be an eye opener for a lot of people that don't really understand how different it, different it is in this part of the village, even the ocean view side where we count, the numbers are orders of magnitude less. So I think that's good information to have when we review this parking plan. I'd like to see that as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Public Works Manager at the Information ZZ, Data ZZ, I believe. Yeah, we uh, we need to have uh, the guys go out and recollect uh, so we have uh, more data to, to discuss. But yes, we can do that for the next meeting. Okay, so if that's part of the parking plan, it'd be appreciated on behalf of Council. Thank you. Councillor Bain, let's close off on this topic. Yeah, um, just to, further to the comments I made uh, um, amongst councillors about the BEOs coming out. Um, rather than uh, have them come out and if there's not too much action, my suggestion would be to get them to uh, have a look at some of the other bylaw enforcement issues. For, and the one I mentioned was um, uh, people burning, uh, producing excessive smoke. I think it would be a good idea to have a BEO knock on their door and advise them of the bylaw and the, the amount of pollution in particular. Uh, and could they please decrease their smoke amounts? Um, there are other bylaws that may be helpful, and I was thinking that in particular up until uh, April 15th when there's a complete shutdown on the burning. Um, if we don't uh, enforce our bylaws, they're just ink on paper, so I think it would be worthwhile. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. So let's just recap on this one. So I dealt with the first part of this, which was the issuance of a ticket to the hiker uh, we park near the hydrant and staff will take care of that. Thank you. The second one is that our next council meeting, uh, uh, we're going to be looking at increased, potential for increased uh, by law enforcement coverage throughout the balance of the year and also parking revenue as well uh, as part of the parking plan, which would come forward. And also we'd like to see the the hiking meter data, uh, whatever the comparison period, best you can get it, public works manager. So I think I recaptured everybody's wish list on this. Uh, because this is a piece of public correspondence, I will write back to the two residents and council will see that likely tomorrow. And that'll be in the next agenda. So if there's no other comments on this, we'll consider this topic covered and we'll move on to any other council, uh, councillors who wish to speak on their matters. Okay, consider mine closed. Council members, anything they want to go? Um, I know that Councillor Barber has got the CAC shortly. Uh, we won't jump yet, Councillor Barber, but if there's something else somebody wants to bring up, this would be at the time. None? Okay, committees, board of variants, and this is just uh, to receive uh, uh, actually the new uh, inaugural meeting for the two members. Uh, not the hardest case, not the easiest case. I'll put forward a motion to receive the draft. Can I have a second? Thank you, all in favor? Yes, opposed no, thank you. Next one is the Climate Action Committee draft minutes. Councilor Barmer, I'll hand this off to you. Uh, just give me a quick second. So the minutes are in the meeting. I've made a note. Uh, there's one particular item I wanted to highlight um, and sort of further for discussion. 
and specifically as it relates to um, uh, the ICIP Clean BC Communities Fund grant that um, uh, uh, CFO Rook forwarded to me and we took that to the Climate Action Committee uh, last week and, and had some discussion about it, but basically wanted to understand the process of defining scope first off. So how would we define scope of any potential retrofits or upgrades that would fall within the parameters of the grant? Uh, secondly, how the Climate Action Committee could support that effort and what we could do to help uh, move this grant application forward if, we, if Council decides it's feasible. Um, you know, understanding uh, the potential benefit of hiring a grant writer um, to win that kind of money. Uh, it's, it's kind of understood that grant writing is, is, is complex, especially for uh, the kind of um, uh, grants like this that inv uh, involve uh, capital, uh, capital cost estimating to a certain level, uh, that involve uh, GHG reduction calculations. Um, so it's, you know, there's elements that are probably and possibly outside of our uh, wheelhouse that we might have to bring outside help into. Um, into the fold. Uh, so we really just wanted to get a feel for um, uh, Council's appetite on moving forward on this um, and how we would take the next logical step. Uh, in my mind, that is scoping the project and defining what it is we want to include and then understanding how we get costs out of that and, and kind of present a picture to Council to say, look, we're looking at a quarter million dollar retrofit or we're looking at a half million dollar retrofit and we can get 73 cents to the dollar from this grant and do we have 27% to contribute? Um, so I just wanna put that out there and I wonder if we can bring that forward uh, at the next council meeting, if staff has already uh, started scoping uh, community hall retrofits, maybe there's work that has already been started so we understand sort of the big hitters, um, you know, the oil furnace, the windows, et cetera. So uh, yeah, I'll just leave it at that and, and open up the floor to discussion. Um, actually, um, yeah, I do have um, a few points to make about this. This is an ISIP grant, but it, it is very technical. And I actually don't think staff, well, we don't have the time at this time of year, nor the ability to do a lot of it. And it was something that I thought lent itself greatly to the skills of the Climate Action Committee. Um, so your first steps are exactly right. Um, it's determining what you want to apply for. And I don't think it can wait to the next council meeting. I think you'd have to come to the next council meeting in two weeks with an outline of what you wanted to do. Um, and I know nothing about solar panels, for example, which I think would be part of it. So again, I would look to the Climate Action Committee to be getting the quotes and getting the information we need and putting together what the costs are. With regard to a grant writer, um, that's a tough one because we haven't had a lot of success with grant writers. They basically write the grant based on the information provided to them by staff. <laughs> when we had a grant writer for this, uh, the first um, application for the Bayview DWIP, they spent hours talking to Nye and I, particularly Nye, getting information and then putting it into the grant. So again, um, I because I know you did uh, most of the ED Charger Grant, Councillor Barnier, um, for the first application we did. Again, I saw it lending itself to the skill set of the, of the CAC. Um, the GHG, that is something we would probably have to get an outside source to do it, but again, it would be getting quotes on that. Like I see this as an all hands on deck for the CAC, trying to, um, you know, first of all, determine what they want to do. And the reason I sent the guide is the guide is the best thing to read to understand what we have to do. Um, it's, um, it outlines in detail all the requirements of the project. And like I say, the ISIP grants at, at best are challenging, but this one is so much more technical. And then um, staff's role would be to help consolidate all of this. And then we would actually have to do the application. It has to be done to the ID. So all the answers have to be entered into this program. Um, the deadline is May 25th. Uh, the, um, all the ICIPs are oversubscribed. We're expecting this one to be oversubscribed as well. And we find you can have kind of a sweet spot for these grants. But, um, it's not a huge amount of money considering you can apply to projects up to $15 million. I think it's why we were successful with the clot building as well. You, you want to just like squeak in there. So I'm thinking even fi a $500,000 retrofit might be a bit high if you just sort of identify the things you want to do and then get costs on them and get a sense of what um, the dollar value will be. 
Okay. No, that's fair, Pam. And so we would need some support from staff just to collect data like, you know, what kind of heating system is there? I mean, we're, we're kind of guessing at this a little bit. So I understand there's an oil furnace. We understand there's a, a, a wood burning uh, fireplace somewhere, you know, just to understand that inventory of assets that would be in the building that would qualify. Um, and then we could probably take to the next step. I don't know if there's a drawing of the uh, of the community hall, like a, a set of plans that we could look at, uh, mm -hmm. something to inform the logistics of the scope. And I'm happy to take that on. I'm happy to champion uh, coordinating that um, that scope development and mm -hmm. to bring that to council for consideration. I'm also happy to uh, shop around for pricing and and uh, but I am curious to see if council has an appetite to provide any kind of funding if we need to, let's say, do some greenhouse gas reduction calculations or get a Class C uh, capital cost estimate, which the grant application calls for. So hiring a cost estimator just to give us a, you know, uh, a double check that we got the numbers right. It shows a bit of credence with, with uh, the grant uh, bodies. Um, you know, I'm very comfortable with the grant application world, so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely keen to support that. That's right. Councillor Bar Mayor, if I can go first, there's over 3,000 municipalities in Canada. We're always punching above our weight, and the CFO said it's going to be a tough application. I'm all for supporting you in the soft cost for the incidentals to, to make it worthwhile. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And I will add, I would definitely see this as a collaborative effort. I just... Um, the past I sit grants, like staff have been able to do completely on our own. And as soon as I read this guide, I realized, yeah, we were going to definitely need some assistance from the Climate Action Committee to, to get this grant application done. Um, because it's an open state, but it is due um, May 25th. So we would have to do a whole schedule of when I would need um, you know, information in order to get the grant application done. But I do think it's something we, we need to start working on now. Um, uh, okay. I can I can kick that off. I can rally the forces right away. So yeah, I think maybe uh, um, maybe staff should discuss at Thursday's meeting uh, and and try and pull the information like the building plans, etc. The baseline starting yeah. point. Yeah. yeah, starting point exactly. Thanks, and I appreciate that. Yeah, I got a counselor Abbott, and I, so I'll let's just pick fifteen grand as a number for the budget to hold this in place. I mean, it's ultimately going to be budget approved if we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, they need the soft cost, so let's do that. Say how much? 15, 10, I don't know. She's so, uh, given, given sort of the, the rough ideas and the, the things that have been discussed about potential scope and solar panels, and the Climate Action Committee did some preliminary work on that kind of stuff already, I could see this adding up pretty quickly to two or three or even $400,000. So our share is gonna be, you know, could be 50 to $100,000 and would be in the financial plan for 2023 because it's not gonna happen this year. So, no. uh, but council would be looking at making a commitment, making a commitment. to, you know, to get a, a rough idea as to, as to the, the portion payable by the municipality. You know, you might be wanting to think a little bit higher number and. I was just doing a soft yeah. class to make sure that our applications qualify. Okay, I see. So okay. that would be I the GHG that. calculation. Yeah, GHG calcs, capital okay. cost estimate, any kind, maybe we have to get a sketch or two done. Um, that's yeah. about it. Um, lots, of, lots of good companies out there that um, you know, to play here, so. can give us an hour or two of their time. So it's, uh, you know, I appreciate that. Uh, Mayor McLaughlin, thank you. Thank you, and we'll see this in the five-year plan somewhere. Okay, Councillor Abbott. And the only thing is, oh, sorry. Just a second. Yeah. I was just going to say, in terms of, I'll, I'll go through the uh, guide as well, and maybe, and maybe um, you could as well, um, Councillor Baumeier, too. Um, I think there might be a minimum requirement of your request reducing GHGs by a certain amount. So I'm thinking now that might be just brainstorming the first step to make sure the things we're proposing actually reduce our GHGs enough or we'll, we won't even be considered. So there's sort of an initial game plan we have to figure mm -hmm. out and some things we'll have to determine if it's even worth applying for, if we can meet those targets that are required from the grant. Okay, so uh, before I go to Councillor Abbott, which I will in two seconds, so a lot of this is gonna fall on the shoulders of the CAC, Councillor Barmere with uh, 
really upfront by staff, but then you're going to have to bring it back in March pretty quick. Okay, Councillor Abbott. Um, yeah, I'm more comfortable where this is going uh, as, as we keep talking from, from when I first put my hand up. Um, Pam, you mentioned a sweet spot. What, do you have any, any feel for what this grant might, sweet spot might be? No, because I don't really know what the costs are. When I say sweet spot, we've just, we've had success in the past with grants that I mean, it's just, it's a little bit political. They're giving away, let's say $76 million. You have these people with 15 and $20 million projects that are fighting out. And I think yeah. they like to say, just not just the dollar value of the grants they've awarded, but the number. And sometimes like even going back to our, um, the, um, the grant before the CWF, we asked for $300,000 and they're sort of easier to approve and then they make the decisions with the larger ones. That's just my sense. I've got a little bit of feedback from that when we've had our, so I wanna say the lower the better, but then you also have to ask for enough to get what you want, but it might be better to just do the basics of what you need and not a lot of bells and whistles. Because so, it makes yeah, so my, my first thought was um, pick the low hanging fruit, obviously, lower the better, prioritize the things and these grants come around we you know they do that they get oversubscribed they come back in a in a year or two um mm -hmm. so there's always another chance to have another go at something different but i think obviously i mean i think that's probably where norm's mind's going anyway put the list of priorities down there um i find it hard to believe there's going to be anything but what we all furnace <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be the one you want to identify and and rather than ask for, for lots of stuff and any bells and whistles, pick something you think you've got a good chance at winning, you know, kiss, keep it simple. Um, and yeah, I'm certainly behind that. It'll be an iterative approach, Councillor Abbott, and the, the GHG reduction threshold will set the benchmark of what we have to achieve and we'll have to work backwards from there and kind of go, okay, if we put these four pieces out of 10 together, we'll get there. Or if we put these 10 pieces out of 20 together, we'll get there. Um, so I think that'll be the threshold we have to hit. And so we just have to pick, start with the low hanging fruit, the biggest GHG uh, con contributors and, and kind of work backwards down the list. Um, and it'll quickly, it'll quickly shed out who's, you know, the, the nice to haves versus the, the things we have to deal with at a, at a bare minimum. Thank you. Thank you. But, uh, you know, this, I'll keep you guys apprised all along. So there's not going to be any uh, you know, complete transparency here. Councillor Farmer, you got the good feeling you're looking for? Yeah, no, I do. I think I really support the, the uh, or really uh, appreciate the support on this. And um, I think we have a, a good chance. Thank you very much for your report and councillors for weighing in. Uh, emergency services, I didn't see a report, so we'll pass. Uh, resolutions, the Grand Fondo, that time of year again, not quite, but soon. The motion is that council direct staff to write a letter of support to the Ministry of Transportation <clears throat> for the RBC Grand Fondo Whistler cycling event taking place September 10, 2022 from Vancouver Whistler. I'll put that forward. Can I have a hand for a second, please? Thank you. Any discussion? None. Call a motion. All those in favor, please confirm by saying yes. Those opposed, no. Yes. Sure. Good, Terry. Thank you. Next is the bylaws, and this is the um, water rates. And this is the last reading, and the motion is that the water rates and regulations bylaw number two, 1971, amendment bylaw number 609, 2022 be adopted. I'll put that forward, can I have a hand for a second? Thank you, Councillor Bing. Uh, nothing more to say, we've seen this before. Uh, last comment before I call a motion. There being none, I will call a motion. All those in favor, please confirm by saying yes. Those opposed, no. Yes. Yes. Terry, thank you. And the next one is right over. Uh, that the sewer user rates bylaw number 122, 1984, amendment bylaw number 610, 2022 be adopted. This is the last reading. I'll put forward that motion. Councilor Barmer, raise your hand for a second. Thank you. And any discussion? This is last reading before I call a motion. None. Call the motion. All those in favor, please confirm by yes. saying yes. Those opposed, no. Yes. Very good. Yes. Uh, next one. Um, and this is on page 107 of our packages. 
And the motion is that pesticide control bylaw number 430, 2011, amendment bylaw number 613, 2022, be introduced a first, second, and third time. I'll put forward that motion. Councillor Abbott, will you raise your hand for a second? Second. And thank you. Uh, I think this is worthy of a little discussion. And neither staff, or the CAO, or the municipal coordinator. Uh, well, basically, the bylaw is uh, updating the uh, the Schedule A that uh, existed in it, which is a uh, uh, basically uh, the Schedule Two of the um, of the uh, sorry, on the wrong page. regulation. Um, so it's just updating that and it's in the bylaw more or less for educational purposes. Um, it would probably be more proper to just have a reference to the, the schedule, the regulation and uh, so that as it gets amended, that's what the by you know, have to update the bylaw. But uh, it does serve a purpose being in the bylaw because it's there and you can use it for educational purposes. If, uh, uh, if you like, and that is also the purpose of uh, adding Schedule B, which is the ministerial order, um, which incorporates the uh, rodenticide uh, prohibitions for public use. There's still uh, restricted use of those uh, of those um, uh, chemicals by uh, by by registered uh, certified. Uh, practitioners, um, but um, this is uh, an opportunity to um, make sure that the public in Lions Bay uh, knows that uh, these are prohibited uh, public uh, chemicals that they can't use. That's about it. Thank you very much. Councillors, any questions? Um, I'm, I'm good with that. The question is more a follow up or a next action. Um, you know, you've mentioned education a few times, so we should probably uh, come up with something once, if, assuming we pass this, um, to make public, the public more aware of it, of the issue, and the and the um, and the regulation. And I could maybe help with uh, in volunteering someone to take that on. As a village update piece or as yeah, I'm a, I'm thinking a village update piece. No, okay. no, I'm thinking a village update piece. Uh, you guys do can it out for this? No? That's rather you good sometime in the next month. Sure. Thanks very much. Uh, for me, I've seen a lot of bylaws, but I don't think I've ever seen a, one with so many disclaimers <laughs> in my life. <laughs> But okay, it's an educational piece. Okay, uh, Councillor Abbott's going to write to the community on this one. Thank you very much, Councillor Abbott. I will call a motion. All those in favor, please confirm by saying yes. Those opposed, no. Yes. yes. Good. Thank you very much, everybody. Which brings us to the Board of Variance Amendment Bylaw. And the motion is that the Board of Variance Bylaw number 502 2016, Amendment Bylaw number 614 2022 be introduced and given a first, second, and third reading. I'll put that forward. Councillor Cunliffe, can you confirm by saying yes? Is the seconder? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 municipal coordinator or CAO, could you give us a quick skinny on this? It looks pretty straightforward. Uh, they're fighting it out for the position, okay. Essentially, um the bylaw noted that a secretary would have to be appointed by council every time, but um, we just changed the wording to make it a bit more um, open in case of staff changes, so that the board of variants will always be supported by a secretary without them being ha having to be appointed by council. And there's also a change in the application form, and that's a requirement under the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act to include um, a disclosure of what we're doing with the information anytime we collect pri private information. 
Questions, counselors? There being none, call a motion. All those in favor, please confirm by saying yes. Those opposed, no. Yes. Yes. Good carry three readings. Uh, good work, municipal coordinator. You got to wait easy on that one. There you go. All right, next up is the correspondence. And again, drum roll for Councillor Bain. It is you on rotation. One page uh, external, um, external uh, items. And as I, I recommend to everybody that you uh, acknowledge receipt of them, unless you want to pull one out. And then we have two more meetings to do tonight. Uh, yeah, most of them are for information only. Um, there's a number of things with uh, um, that came from our MP opportunities for um, uh, wireless services that are too expensive and announcements on trails and pathways. Some of our trailblazers might be interested in and um, uh, workforce permit permission <laughs> promotion. Um, yeah. Whole bunch of general things. I don't think I don't have anything in particular that stands out that I think uh, we need to address here. So if anyone else wants to say something, there being none, thank you very much. Uh, all of these are received. Yep. Okay, which brings us to new business of which there is none, and uh, item number twelve. Uh, the public portion of the meeting where the public can uh, come live with us and address the meeting, uh, address a topic that has been discussed this meeting. And I would ask that uh, the municipal coordinator take over. My battery is dying and this could collapse in a minute. So if there's a member of the public that would like to come forward, please do so now. Um, nobody is coming forward. Um, so with that, we will close the meeting. Uh, actually, sorry, I'm boggled because of this. So we'll say good night to the gallery and we will move to the closed council meeting uh, in a second. And the proposed topics for discussion in the absence of the public are legal matters, personnel, awards, and procurement. And that the meeting be closed to public on the basis of matters considered under the following sections of the community charter and where required, the council does consider that the matters could reasonably be expected to harm the interests of the municipality if they were held in public. And those parts of the charter are section 90, subsection 1, A, B, C, E, G, I, J, and N, and also subsection 90, subsection 90, Part two and B, council does not anticipate reconvening the open meeting for any purpose other than to adjourn the meeting generally and report out if applicable. I will put that forward as motion as well. We'll be going in camera. Councilor Rapid, will you second me? I second. Thank you. Uh, any discussion of those opposed, please confirm by saying no. Otherwise we will go into close now. And we'll say goodbye to the galleries left. Okay, take a five minute bio break. Thank you everybody, stay where they are. Uh, good evening, uh, it is 20 to 11 on Tuesday night. Council has come back from the uh, closed session of the regular meeting of council and is prepared to um, report out on the following items that uh, two, two issues. One, council discussed the Citizen of the Year Award and the Citizen of Distinction Award and requested staff to place a call for nominees in the village update. Second item was uh, personnel matters. And with that, reporting out, we are done for the evening. For councillors, can I have a motion to close? I'll put that forward. Can I have a second? Thank you, Councillor Abbott. All in favor, confirm by saying yes. Those opposed, no. Yes. Yes. Very good. The, uh, the um, closed meeting is closed. We are back into the open. Sorry. That was it. That was the. That was the open. Sorry, we are adjourned. The open meeting. Adjourned in the open meeting. Thank you. So, but we.
We're going to recording. Oh, oh yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Back into the recording here. Yeah, we're okay. You, you're trying to screw with me, right now. Okay, there you go. All right, we are back live again. Time now is uh, 19 minutes to 11, and council has come back from the uh, council strategy committee closed session, and we have the following to report out, and that is that uh, council reviewed supplementary budget requests from staff. And that is all there was to report out. I'll put forward the motion to adjourn. Can I have a second? Councillor Barmer, a hand. Thank you. All those in favor, please confirm by saying yes. Opposed, no. Yes. Good, Good, carried. Carried. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, all. Thanks. Take care. Bye. 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 Council, uh, council, yes. Yeah.